Chapter 27 All Dharmas Are on Fire Every morning, Kasapa brought the Buddha some food, and so the Buddha did not need to go begging in the village. After his daily meal, he walked alone on forest paths or down to the lotus pond. In the later afternoons, Kasapa would join him for discussion beneath the trees or beside the pond. The more time he spent with the Buddha, the more Kasapa understood how wise and virtuous the Buddha was. One night, it rained so heavily that by the morning the Naranjara River had overflowed its banks. Nearby fields and dwellings were quickly submerged by flood waters. Boats desperately went out to try to rescue people. Kasapa's community was able to climb to higher land in time, but no one could find Gautama. Kasapa sent several boats to look for him. At last he was found standing on a distant hill. The water subsided as quickly as it has risen. The next morning the Buddha took his begging bowl and went down into the village to see how the villagers had fared in the flood. Luckily no one had drowned. The people told the Buddha that because they did not own many possessions in the first place, the flood had not robbed them of much. Kasapa's disciples began to rebuild the fire sanctuary which had been destroyed by fire and to rebuild their huts washed away by the flood. One afternoon, while the Buddha and Kasapa stood along the banks of the Naranjara, Kasapa said, Gautama, the other day you spoke about the meditation on one's body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness. I have been practicing that meditation and have begun to understand how one's feelings and perceptions determine the quality of one's life. I also see that there is no permanent element to be found in any of the five rivers. I can even see that the belief in a separate self is false. But I still don't understand why one should follow a spiritual path if there is no self. Who is there to be liberated? The Buddha asked, Kasapa, do you accept that suffering is a truth? Yes, Gautama, I accept that suffering is a truth. Do you agree that suffering has causes? Yes, I accept that suffering has causes. Kasapa, when the causes of suffering are present, suffering is present. When the causes of suffering are removed, suffering is also removed. Yes, I see that when the causes of suffering are removed, suffering itself is removed. The cause of suffering is ignorance, a false way of looking at reality. Thinking the impermanent is permanent, that is ignorance. Thinking there is a self when there is not, that is ignorance. From ignorance is born greed, anger, fear, jealousy and countless other sufferings. The path of liberation is the path of looking deeply at things in order to truly realize the nature of impermanence, the absence of a separate self, and the interdependence of all things. This path is the path which overcomes ignorance. Once ignorance is overcome, suffering is transcended. That is true liberation. There is no need for a self for there to be liberation. Uravila Kasapa sat silently for a moment and then said, Gautama, I know you speak only from your own direct experience. Your words do not simply express concepts. You have said that liberation can only be attained through the efforts of meditation, by looking deeply into things. Do you think that all ceremonies, rituals and prayers are useless? The Buddha pointed 
to the other side of the river and said, Kasapa, if a person wants to cross to the other shore, what should he do? If the water is shallow enough, he can wade across. Otherwise, he will have to swim or row a boat across. I agree. But what if he is unwilling to wade, swim or row a boat? What if he just stands on this side of the river and prays to the other shore to come to him? What would you think of such a man? I would say he was being quite foolish. Just so, Kasapa, if one doesn't overcome ignorance and mental obstructions, one cannot cross to the other side to liberation, even if one spends one's whole life praying. Suddenly, Kasapa burst into tears and prostrated himself before the Buddha's feet. Gautama, I have wasted more than half my life. Please, accept me as your disciple and give me the chance to study and practice the way of liberation with you. The Buddha helped Kasapa stand back up and said, I would not hesitate to accept you as my disciple. But what of your 500 devotees? Who will guide them if you leave? Kasapa answered, Gautama, give me a chance to speak with them this morning. Tomorrow afternoon, I will let you know of my decision. The Buddha said, the children in Uravila village call me the Buddha. Kasapa was surprised. That means awakened one, doesn't it? I will call you the same. The next morning, the Buddha went begging in Uravila. Afterwards, he went to the lotus pond to sit. Late that afternoon, Kasapa came looking for him. He told the Buddha that all 500 of his devo devo devotees agreed to become disciples under the Buddha's guidance. The next day, Uravila Kasapa and all his followers shaved their heads and beards and threw the locks of hair into the Neranjara River, along with all the liturgical objects they had used for fire worship. They bowed before the Buddha and recited three times, I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. I take refuge in the Dharma, the way of understanding and love. I take refuge in the Sangha, the community that lives in harmony and awareness. Their recitation of the three refuges echoed throughout the forest. When the ordination was completed, the Buddha spoke to the new bhikkhus about the Four Noble Truths and how to observe, observe one's breath, body and mind. He showed them how to beg for food and how to eat in silence. He asked them to release all the animals they had once raised for food and sacrifices. That afternoon, the Buddha met with Kasapa and ten of Kasapa's senior students to teach them the fundamentals of the way of awakening, as well as to discuss how to best organize the Sangha. Kasapa was a talented organizer and leader, and with the Buddha, he assigned capable senior students to train the younger bhikkhus, just as the Buddha had done in Isipatthana. The next day, Nadi Kasapa, Uravila Kasapa's younger brother, arrived with his disciples in a state of shock. The day before, he and his 300 devotees who lived downstream from Uravila had seen hundreds of braids and liturgical objects floating in the river and they feared something, some terrible catastrophe had befallen the community of his elder brother. When Nadi Kasapa reached Uravila, it was the hour of begging, and so he was unable to find anyone. His worst fears seemed to be confirmed. 
but slowly Bikus began to return from begging, and they explained how they had all taken vows to follow a monk named Gautama. Uravila Kasapa returned from begging with the Buddha and was most happy to see his younger brother. He invited him for a walk in the forest. They were gone for a good length of time, and when they returned, Nadi Kasapa announced that he and his 300 devotees would also take refuge in the Buddha. Both brothers agreed to send someone to summon their brother Gaya, Gaya Kasapa. Thus, in the space of only seven days, the 200 devotees of Gaya Kasapa were also ordained as bhikkhus. The Kasapa brothers were well known for their brotherly love and sharing of common ideals. Together, they became deeply devoted students of the Buddha. One day, after all the bhikkhus had returned from begging, the Buddha summoned them to gather on the slopes of the mountain in Gaya. Nine hundred bhikkhus ate in silence with the Buddha and the three Kasapa brothers. When they were finished eating, they all turned their gaze to the Buddha. Sitting serenely upon a large rock, the Buddha began to speak. Bhikkhus, all dharmas are on fire. What is on fire? The six sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind are all on fire. The six objects of the senses, form, sound, smell, taste, touch and objects of mind are all on fire. The six consciousnesses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, feeling and thought are all on fire. They are burning from the flames of desire, hatred and illusion. They are burning from the flames of birth, old age, sickness and death, and from the flames of pain, anxiety, frustration, worry, fear and despair. Because every feeling is burning, whether it is an unpleasant, pleasant or neutral feeling. Feelings arise and are conditioned by the sense organs, objects of the sense organs, and the sense consciousnesses. Feelings are burning from the flames of desire, hatred and illusion. Feelings are burning from the flames of birth, old age, sickness and death, and from the flames of pain, anxiety, frustration, worry, fear and despair. Bhikkhus, do not allow yourselves to be consumed by the flames of desire, hatred and illusion. See the impermanent and interdependent nature of all dharmas in order not to be enslaved by the cycle of birth and death created by the sense organs, objects of the senses and the sense consciousnesses. 900 bhikkhus listened intently. Each man was deeply moved. They were happy to know they had found the path that taught how to look deeply in order to attain liberation. Faith welled in the heart of every bhikkhu there. The Buddha remained in Gaya Sisa for three months to teach the new bhikkhus and the bhikkhus made great progress. The Kasapa brothers were talented assistants to the Buddha and they helped him guide and teach the Sangha. Chapter 28 Palm Forest The morning had arrived for the Buddha to depart from Gaya Sisa and make his way to Rajagaha, 
Ravila Kasapa asked the Buddha to allow the entire Sangha to accompany him. The Buddha was reluctant, but Kasapa explained how easily 900 bhikkhus could travel together. There would be many forests around Rajgaha where the bhikkhus could dwell. They could beg in the many villages there, as well as in the capital city itself, making contact with many local people. Moreover, added Kasapa, the number of bhikkhus was now too large for the population of Gaya to support. Everything would be easier in Rajgaha. Seeing how knowledgeable Uravila Kasapa was about the situation in Modaga, the Buddha agreed to let the 900 bhikkhus join him. The Kasapa brothers divided the Sangha into 36 groups of 25 bhikkhus. Each group was led by a senior student. This arrangement allowed the bhikkhus to make ever greater progress on the path. Ten days were needed for them all to reach Rajgaha. Each morning they begged in small villages and ate silently in the forests or the fields. When they finished eating, they began to walk again, travelling in their own small groups. The sight of the bhikkhus walking quietly and slowly made a deep impression on all who saw them. When they neared Rajgaha, Uravila Kasapa led them to Palm Forest, where the Supatita Temple was located. Palm Forest was only two miles south of the capital. The next morning the bhikkhus took their bowls and went begging in the city. They walked in single file in their small groups, taking calm, slow steps. They held their bowls serenely while their eyes looked straight ahead. Following the Buddha's instructions, they stood before each house without discriminating whether it belonged to rich or poor. If no one appeared after a few moments, they moved on to the next house. While silently waiting for food offerings to be made, they mindfully observed their breath. When they received a food offering, they bowed in thanks. They never made any comment about whether the food looked good or bad. Sometimes a lay person making the offering asked the bhikkhu for a few, a few questions about the Dharma and the bhikkhu answered thoughtfully to the best of his ability. The bhikkhu explained that he belonged to the Sangha of Gautama, the Buddha. He would speak about the Four Noble Truths the five precepts for the laity and the noble eightfold path. The bhikkhus always returned to Palm Forest by noon to share their meal in silence before listening to a discourse on the Dharma given by the Buddha. Afternoons and evenings were reserved for meditation practice. Thus, after the noon hour, no one in the city saw the saffron-robed bhikkhus. By the end of two weeks, most of the city was aware of the presence of the Buddha's Sangha. On cool afternoons, many laypersons came to Palm Forest to meet the Buddha and to learn about the way of awakening. Before the Buddha had a chance to visit his friend, the young king, Senaya Bimbisara, he had already learned of the Buddha's presence. Sure that this new teacher was the same young monk he had met on the mountain, he mounted his carriage and ordered it to be driven to Palm Forest. Many other carriages followed his, for he had invited over a hundred highly regarded Brahmana teachers and intellectuals to join him. When they reached the edge of the forest, the king stepped out of his carriage, accompanied by, their, by the queen and their son. When the Buddha was informed of the king's arrival, he and Uruvila Kasapa personally went out to greet him and all his guests. 
all the bhikkhus were seated in great circles on the earth, waiting to hear the Buddha's Dharma talk. The Buddha invited the king, queen, prince and other guests to be seated too. King Bimbisara introduced as many of the guests as he could remember names, but sometimes had to ask a Brahmin to introduce himself. Among the guests were many scholars, well versed in the Vedas, and belonging to many different schools of religious thought. Most of these men had heard the name of Uruvila Kasapa. A number of them had even met him before. But no one had ever heard of the Buddha. They were surprised to see how reverently Kasapa treated the Buddha, even though Gautama Sakya was so much younger than Kasapa. They whispered to one another, trying to figure out whether Gautama was Kasapa's disciple or Kasapa was Gautama's disciple. Aware of their confusion, Uravila Kasapa stood up and approached the Buddha. He joined his palms and spoke clearly and with respect. Gautama, the enlightened one, most precious teacher in this life. I am Uruvila Kasapa, your disciple. Allow me to offer you my most profound respect. Then he prostrated himself before the Buddha three times. The Buddha helped Kasapa stand up again and asked him to sit by his side. There were no more whispers amongst the Brahmins. Indeed, their respect increased as they looked out over the 900 saffron-robed bhikkhus, sitting with awe-inspiring solemnity. The Buddha spoke about the way of awakening. He spoke about the impermanent and interdependent nature of all things in life. He said that the path of awakening could help one overcome false views and transcend suffering. He spoke about how observing the precepts could help one attain concentration and understanding. His voice resounded like a great bell. It was as warm as spring sunshine, as gentle as light rain, and as majest majestic as the rising tide. More than 1,000 people listened no one dared to breathe too loudly or rustle their robes for fear of disturbing the sound of the Buddha's wondrous voice. King Bimbisara's eyes grew brighter by the moment. The more he listened, the more he felt his heart open. So many of his doubts and troubles vanished. A radiant smile appeared on his face. When the Buddha concluded his Dharma talk, King Bimbisara stood up and joined his palms. He said, Lord, from the time I was young, I had five wishes. I have now fulfilled them all. The first wish was to receive coronation and become king. That has been fulfilled. The second wish was to meet in this very life an enlightened teacher. That has also been fulfilled. The third wish was to have a chance to show respect to such a teacher. That wish has now been fulfilled. The fourth wish was to have such a teacher show me the true path. That wish has now been fulfilled. And the fifth wish was to be able to understand the teachings of the Enlightened One. Master, this wish has just been fulfilled. Your wondrous teaching has brought me much understanding. Lord, please accept me as your lay disciple. The Buddha smiled his acceptance. The king invited the Buddha and all 900 of his bhikkhus to have a meal at the palace 
on the day of the full moon. The Buddha gladly accepted. All the other guests stood up to thank the Buddha. Twenty of them expressed the desire to be accepted as the Buddha's disciples. The Buddha and Uruvila Kasapa accompanied the king, the queen and the little prince back to the edge of the forest. The Buddha knew that in less than a month the rainy season would begin and it would be impossible to return to his homeland. Therefore, he resolved to remain with the 900 bhikkhus in Palm Forest for another three months. He knew that after three months of practice, the Sangha would be strong and stable enough for him to depart. He would leave in the spring, the season of clear skies and tender new plants. King Seniya Bimbisara began at once to prepare for the reception of the Buddha and his bhikkhus. He planned to serve them in the great palace court, paved with fine bricks. He called to his people to deck the streets with lanterns and flowers to welcome the Buddha and his Sangha. He invited a great many other people to attend, including all the members of the government and their families. Children close to the age of the 12-year-old Prince Atajat Jatsatu were invited too, knowing that the Buddha and his bhikkhus did not allow others to kill for their sake. He ordered that only delicious vegetarian foods be prepared. They had just ten days to prepare for the reception. <clears throat> Chapter 29 Dependent Co-Arising Throughout the following weeks, many seekers came to the Buddha and asked to be ordained as bhikkhus. Many of them were highly educated young men from wealthy families. The Buddha's senior students performed the ordination ceremonies and gave the new, new bhikkhus basic instruction in the practice. Other young people, women as well as men, came to Palm Forest and took the three refuges. One day, Kundana gave the three refuges to a gathering of nearly 300 young people. After the ceremony, he spoke to them about the three precious gems, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. The Buddha is the awakened one. An awakened person sees the nature of life and the cosmos. Because of that, an awakened person is not bound by illusion, fear, anger or desire. An awakened person is a free person, filled with peace and joy, love and understanding. Master Gautama, our teacher, is a completely awakened person. He shows us the way in this life so that we may overcome forgetfulness and become awakened ourselves. Every one of us contains Buddha nature. We can all become a Buddha. Buddha nature is the capacity to awaken and transcend all ignorance. If we practice the way of awareness, our Buddha nature will shine more brightly every day until one day we too shall attain total freedom, peace and joy. We must each find the Buddha within our own heart. The Buddha is the first precious gem. The Dharma is the path which leads to awakening. It is the path which the Buddha teaches, the path which helps us to transcend the prisons of ignorance, anger, fear and desire. This path leads to freedom, peace and joy. It enables us to love and understand all others. 
Understanding and love are the two most beautiful fruits of the path of awakening. The Dharma is the second precious gem. The Sangha is the community of persons practicing the way of awakening, those who travel this path together. If you want to practice the way of liberation, it is important to have a community to practice with. If you are all alone, difficulties along the path may hinder your realization of awakening. It is important to take refuge in the Sangha, whether you are an ordained bhikkhu or a lay person. The Sangha is the third precious gem. Young people, today you have taken refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. With the support of these refuges, you will not wander aimlessly, but will be able to make real progress on the path of enlightenment. It has been two years since I took refuge in the Three Gems myself. Today, you have vowed to travel the same path. Let us rejoice together that we have taken refuge in the Three Precious Gems. Of course, these gems have been present in our own hearts from beginningless time. Together we will practice the way of liberation to allow these three gems to shine from within us. The young people were greatly encouraged by Kondana's words. They all felt a new source of vitality surge within their hearts. <clears throat> During those same days, the Buddha received two exceptional new disciples, Sariputta and Moggallana, into his Sangha of Bhikkhus. They were both disciples of the famous ascetic Sanjaya, who lived in Rajgaha. Sanjaya's devotees were called Paravajakas. Sariputta and Moggallana were close friends, respected for their intelligence and open-mindedness. Open they had promised each other that whoever attained the Great Way first would immediately inform the other. One day, Sariputta saw the bhikkhu Asaji begging in Rajgaha and he was immediately drawn by Asaji's relaxed and serene bearing. Sariputta thought to himself, this appears to be someone who has attained the way. I knew such persons could be found. I will ask him who his teacher is and what his teaching is. Sariputta quickened his pace to catch up with Asaji, but then stopped himself, not wanting to disturb the bhikkhu while he was silently begging from house to house. Sariputta resolved to wait until Asaji was finished begging before approaching him. Without making himself noticed, Sariputta followed Asaji. When Asaji's bowl was filled with offerings and he turned to leave the city, Sariputta joined his palms in respectful greeting and said, Monk, you radiate such peace and calm. Your virtue and understanding shine in the way you walk, in the expression on your face, and in your every gesture. Please, allow me to ask you who your teacher is, and at what practice centre you reside. What methods does your teacher teach? Asaji looked at Sari Puta for a moment. And then he smiled in a most friendly manner. He answered, I study and practice under the guidance of the Master Gautama of the Sakya clan, who is known as the Buddha. He is presently dwelling near Supatita temple in the Palm Forest. Sariputta's eyes brightened. What is his teaching? Can you share it with me? The Buddha's teaching is deep and lovely. 
I have not grasped it fully yet. You should come and receive the teachings directly from the Buddha. But Sariputta implored Asaji, Please, can't you share with me even just a few words of the Buddha's teaching? It would be so precious to me. I will come for more teaching later. Asaji smiled and then recited a short gata. From interdependent origins, all things arise and all things pass away. So teaches the perfectly enlightened one. Sariputta suddenly felt his heart open as though it were being flooded by a bright light. A flawless glimpse of true Dharma flashed before him. He bowed to Asaji and quickly ran to seek his friend Moggallana. When Moggallana saw Sariputta's radiant face, he asked, My brother, what has made you so happy? Can you have found the true path? Please tell me, brother. Sariputta related what had just happened. When he recited the gutta to Moggallana to hear, Moggallana also felt a sudden flash of light illuminate his heart and mind. Suddenly, he saw the universe as an interconnected net. This was because that was. This arose because that arose. This was not because that was not. This passed away because that passed away. The belief in a creator of all things vanished in this understanding of dependent co-arising. He now understood how one could cut through the endless cycle of birth and death. The door of liberation opened before him. Moggallana said, Brother, we must go to the Buddha at once. He is the teacher we have been waiting for. Sariputta agreed, but reminded him, what of the 250 Parivrajaka brothers who have long placed their faith and trust in us as elder brothers of the community? We can't just abandon them. We must go and inform them of our decision first. The two friends made their way to the Parivrajaka main gathering place and explained to their fellow practitioners their decision to leave the community and become disciples of the Buddha. When the Parivrajakas heard that Sariputta and Moggallana were about to leave them, they were grieved. The community would not be the same without these two elder brothers. And so they all expressed their desire to follow them and become disciples of the Buddha too. Sariputta and Moggallana went to Master Sanjaya and told him of the decision of the community. He entreated them to stay, saying, If you remain here, I will transfer the leadership of the community to you both. He said this three times, but Sariputta and Moggallana had made up their minds. They said, Respected Master, we embarked on the spiritual path in order to find liberation and not become religious leaders. If we do not know the true path, how can we lead others? We must seek out the Master Gautama, for he has attained the path we have long sought for. Sariputta and Moggallana prostrated themselves before Sanjaya and then departed followed by the other Parivrajakas. They walked to Palm Forest, where they all prostrated before the Buddha and asked to be ordained. The Buddha spoke to them about the Four Noble Truths and accepted them as bhikkhus in his Sangha. After the ordination ceremony, the number of bhikkhus in Palm Grove numbered 
1,250. Here ends book one. And dear friends, this is where we pause in our story. Go gently. Goodbye.